Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. Now, the European Council is widely known through its regular summits and heads of state and government, but less well known is the Council of Europe, the continent's human rights watchdog, founded in 1949 by 10 nations. It now numbers 46 countries, with participation stretching well beyond the EU member states. The cornerstone of the Council of Europe is the European Convention of Human Rights, which provides the framework for citizens to take their cases to the European Court of Human Rights if they've exhausted legal avenues in their national justice system. Well, my guest is the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Maria Pecinovic Buric, and she's been in, the, in this job for nearly four years. Before that, she was Croatia's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign and European Affairs. Secretary General, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you very much for your invitation. You recently had a summit of uh, in Reykjavik of leaders, heads of state and government of members of the Council of Europe, and you had a stark warning there uh, that there is democratic backsliding happening, that Europe has a stark choice either to consolidate democracy or to continue this slide in democracy. W why a slide? Well, let me first say that this is not something that was uh, diagnosed just last uh, couple of years. It's, a pro it's been a process. And in the Council of Europe, uh, I issue yearly annual report on human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And uh, we can see back uh, at least a decade from now uh, that uh, the uh, backsliding of democracy in some parts of Europe was rather uh, accelerating. And I think the worst uh, example of backsliding uh, is the Russian Federation, who was a member until last year and had to be exposed because of its backsliding. Uh, that resulted in a uh, horrible illegal aggression against Ukraine. You did mention in previous uh, years, uh, as you said, that uh, democracy was in distress, for example, you said that in 2021. So are, are these repeated warnings that you're giving, are they, are they falling on deaf ears? I mean, do you feel you're not having much impact, perhaps? Well, if you, if you read this year's report, which I mm. issued in May, you could see that there are indeed some, uh, some good stories, uh, like on Istanbul Convention, Convention Against uh, Domestic Violence and uh, Violence Against Women, on child issues, issues and some others. However, there are places around Europe where this backsliding, in particular uh, in this year's report, uh, um, uh, focusing on attacks on journalists uh, more and more uh, heavily, uh, not only because of the war where some uh, dozen already uh, lost their lives and uh, more than 2,000 uh, are wounded, uh, but also in, in, in other parts of Europe. Uh, uh, another uh, area where we see the backsliding is uh, certainly when it comes to the uh, rule of law also mm. standards uh, to be applied uh, and uh, uh, certainly for polarizing uh, uh, environment in political life that is heated and overheated with the hate speech, you, online and offline. You mentioned the rule of law, which leads me to uh, what tools does the Council of Europe have? I mean, you, you obviously have monitoring bodies and advisory bodies. For example, Greco, the group of states against corruption, which issues evaluation reports and compliance reports. So when a country doesn't comply, what, what actually happens? Well, there are uh, regular monitoring for each uh, council of Europe uh, member state uh, and Greco member state and uh, uh, we uh, Greco uh, has recently issued what we call fourth and fifth round fourth uh, round concerns MPs judges and prosecutors and the fifth round for the countries which uh, already were in this phase is executive powers so what Greco does it's uh, it's uh, looks how the health of uh, uh, the, the the fight against corruption and in integrity of institu public institutions is upheld and uh, gives recommendations to be fulfilled. Uh, and then they uh, have a regular review if uh, that, is, uh, that is done. But for instance, when I go to the countries, I also go and raise these issues. Uh, yeah. So actually, it takes sometimes a while. Yeah, but no fulfill. specific punitive measures as a last result? No, it's a peer pressure. It's yeah. also pressure peer from pressure. the organi organization, mm -hmm. but it does work. Probably at this moment for the 
forth. I must say that the biggest issue is among uh, members of the parliament. So parliaments need uh, more work on Greco To uphold integrity of institutions. L let's just get, get back for a second to your speech in Reykjavik because two things which are obviously re very le relevant to the news. Um, the issue of compensation for Ukraine. You talked about a compensation mechanism and also the question of missing Ukrainian children. So on, on both of those points, what, what's the Council of Europe doing at the moment? Yeah, actually, Ukraine was front and centre for mm. obvious reason in, mm. in the Reykjavik summit. And the, the, the real tangible uh, deliverable is the register of damage that we put together. Mm. And uh, now with the Reykjavik summit, we have 45 uh, state parties uh, participating uh, from uh, member states of Council, uh, Council of Europe, but also beyond. We have all G7 member states. We have European Union as entity also a member. So at this stage, uh, I'm, I'm convening uh, the next meeting uh, on the 27th of June and register is meant to, to give her accountability. Uh, this is the first legally binding uh, document on accountability, which should provide a place for victims uh, uh, that have moral or material damage uh, suffered uh, from Russian aggression to be deposited. And this is only the first path uh, or the first step in the, uh, uh, in the uh, overall uh, comprehensive mechanism of compensation that needs to be put in place, which should comprise then also commission for, for, um, uh, for compensation and the fund. But the register is really urgent, uh, first and needed at this time. So that was very important for children. Uh, we hope, of course, there is a more general problem of children that uh, had to flee uh, and, and leave Ukraine. So for what is uh, the member states uh, coverage and the children who are found on our 46 member states, we uh, plan to establish uh, a register of mechanism for, for, uh, for children. Uh, but what is more worrying is the horrible abduction of, of uh, Ukrainian children who were taken uh, to uh, the Russian Federation. So we have another mechanism, which is uh, Lanzarote Convention. Uh, Fed, uh, Russian Federation st is still a party to that convention. And uh, we intend to, uh, to, to, through that convention, uh, legally use legal instrument to uh, find the whereabouts of these uh, children that, uh, f according to figures, are really uh, in, in great numbers. So uh, they need to be brought uh, back to Ukraine. And I think this mechanism may help in doing so. Earlier, you mentioned the Istanbul Convention as one of the um, more positive trends of the last few years. And in the European Parliament, where we're sitting, MEPs approved that uh, treaty on preventing and combating violence uh, against women and domestic violence back in May. There was a vote here. Several European member states haven't ratified the convention yet. Do you get any sense of, of movement in those states, or is it still very uh, sort of fixed in their positions? Well, let me first say that it's great that we have 38 party to the convention, which is EU, and I wait for depositing instrument uh, on the 28th of uh, June. So that's a very good news. Uh, on the other hand, you, indeed, there are several member states that uh, have not yet uh, ratified the convention, or some even not signed. Uh, so we see some movement in the Czech Republic. Uh, hopefully, uh, that may result in, in ratification. I hope that our current chair, which is Latvia, uh, would uh, uh, use the chairmanship over the Committee of Ministers also to forward uh, with, the, with the ratification. And I think they already made the move uh, within the government in that direction. So the things are moving, but still there are a couple of uh, countries in which I think uh, there will be a longer fight uh, to go. But I think it's uh, worthwhile because it's a golden standard in protecting women against uh, violence and uh, domestic violence. In the last few days, MEPs have voted uh, a landmark Artificial Intelligence Act. They're saying this is the first of its kind in the world. And you've previously argued that human rights standards should be applied to artificial intelligence. Why is that? Absolutely. You know, I think we, we've been uh, very uh, uh, lucky to use for years the artificial intelligence and generally te technological development only as a good news and as development tools 
Uh, but I think over recent years we saw how huge uh, danger is out there uh, for human rights, but also democracy and the rule of law. So uh, we are working already for last three years on the comprehensive uh, 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 instrument convention on, the, on artificial intelligence and human rights uh, with also global uh, outreach. So once is uh, finished, I hope by the mid of uh, next year, 2024, uh, uh, we are negotiating uh, with not only member states of the Council of Europe, but also with our observer states, US, US Mexico, Canada, Japan, mm -hmm. but also Israel, some other may, may, may come. We have civil society present, uh, private sector present. I think we all need uh, to uh, harness all the technological goods that artificial intelligence brings, but we also need even more so uh, to work on ensuring that the artificial intelligence ensures full uh, enjoyment to every individual of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. So I really hope we will get that through uh, this uh, uh, framework convention on artificial intelligence and human rights. What, what, just to remind us, what, what's the, f the time frame for that? So we hope to get it uh, finished, the negotiations, by the mid-2024. Uh, Okay, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for being our guest on Talking Europe. Maria Pecinovic Buric, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. So that's all for part one of the show. But I'll be back with my panel of MEPs for part two, and we'll be discussing Europe and Syria. That's coming up in just a few moments.